kim det sin cycle ul tilikam pikara flaska mefly. Shlahayam Kanawe Tilikam, welcome to our LifeWays video. Today we're going to share the LifeWays concept and how it relates to our community cultural classes. Our LifeWays program began in 2005, we're 10 years old. It began with the basic idea that we wanted to have tribal community culture classes that focused on the specific tribes that make up the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde. We wanted to focus on place connecting to our people's traditional homelands. We wanted to focus on culture that was more specific to our tribes and bands. And we wanted to focus on community and family, the key elements that define our tribe. We'll take you through our short journey of the program and activities that we're inviting you to participate in. So come join us. Prior to contact, there were numerous villages here on the island, Savis Island, being on one side of the island is uh, the Columbia River, Wimoth, and then the mouth of the Willamette River, and then also Moknoma Channel uh, comes in here. And it was an important place for the fisheries, such as salmon and steelhead, sturgeon, the smelt runs going up the river, and the lamprey eel. And it was also important for food resources. Important one was the Pwapato that grew here on the island in the ponds and sloughs. It grew in great quantities here and was used for food as well as a trade item. And then when we look at the villages that were here, there were great pieces of artwork that have come from here that were integrated into their daily living. There's basalt stone carvings that we have examples of. We have basketry that came from here, that came from actually acorn cooking uh, pit areas, antler bone carvings that came from here, and a lot of wood pieces carved that were also from here that we have today that came from our ancestors. Kanima Bluffs is a cultural and historic area for the tribes. The Willamette Tumwaters and Clackamas Chinook lived in this area. This is their original traditional homeland area. There's great significance in the sites in this area. It was also the falls were had to be portaged over and they would bring those canoes here to Kanima Bluffs and the Willamette Tumwaters would host a variety of other visiting tribes to this area for gatherings, for trade, and for those that are preparing to go to the Willamette Valley and to Kalapuya country. Like Oswego area, there's old stories about a creature that lived there. There's flatfish who lives in the, the basalt walls there on the westland side of the river, Winnikites. So there's a lot of the traditional stories that originate from this place. LifeWays is about visiting places that are important to the tribe historically and culturally. One of these places is Tumwater or Willamette Falls here in Oregon City. The falls here were for the fisheries, for salmon fishing, steelhead, sturgeon, and the lamprey that could be gathered off the rocks of the falls. There were villages right here at the falls 
above the falls and below the falls, the fisheries, salmon fishing, that would begin in the springtime. Then runs would be on the Clackamas later in the year. And there'd be fall run, winter runs up the Clackamas and Eagle Creek. Eagle Creek drains into the Clackamas and was a winter village area of the Clackamas Chinook and Wachino family. And uh, Oregon City John's village was here at Willamette Falls. And there's a lot of our old stories that tie to this place. Upriver is Rock Island where Ihumna lived, or the fire tongue. The Wapato was a food resource for our tribes, the Chinookan people that lived here along the Columbia River and the lower Willamette. Here we see the nice big green leaves from the Wapato, um, but it's actually the bulbs that were the food resource. And there's a bulb that's um, about so big and then um, it would be baked in the, in the coals of the fires and it was just kind of, it was also called the Indian potato, pretty much could bake it like a potato, cook it like a potato. Clackamas people along the, the Columbia River where it grew in the ponds and lakes and sloughs. Could be uh, traded also. It was an important trade resource for the tribes in this region because it has a limited area where it grows. And so it could be traded both upriver, down the Willamette Valley, and then into the Puget Sound area. And the Wapato, the way it would be gathered is uh, traditionally women would go out in the ponds and sloughs and lakes and they would be out in their small canoes and then they'd get into the water and wade into the water and uh, use their toes to dig in and find the bulb. And then the bulb, they'd loosen it with their toes and then it'd float to the top. And then that's when they would gather it, fit it in the canoe. So that was one of the ways that it was gathered traditionally. Tipsu. It's like a wawaka but cattail. Pikaba tule and it's like a wawa flispus tipsu. Here we have tule. This native plant had a variety of uses, such as in basketry and making mats. The mats were used for making partitions in the plank houses, uh, for seeding, for making summer houses, and for drying foods such as berries. So we'd wait a little bit, but when we're ready to uh, gather it, we'll just kind of pluck it out from its roots down there, and it just kind of plucks out. And then we'll just kind of gather it. Um, then we'll let it dry, and then it'll be, be ready to use not long after that. Thule was uh, commonly used by some of the tribes, and then another one that will was also used a lot was a uh, cattail. Cattail was used in basketry, making cordage, and making mats. The mats had similar uses as a tule and used for sitting on, drying certain foods such as the berries, and building temporary summer shelters. And then another one is juncus, which was pretty common for our Kalapuya tribes. We have a uh, big leaf maple, buskin Us stick, used for making and carving, uh, like for plates and dishes. Here's Indian plum, and Indian plum is like the first sign of spring. You'll see this one blooming with its white flowers. It's the earliest to bloom in the spring, springtime, and it actually has small little plums. And here's some uh, young Pacific nine bark. And then there's some older with the flowers and stuff. And that was used for arrow making. Here's a aquila or hazel. And there's a hazelnut there. And uh, 
this was a uh, food and then also used in basketry uh, for making hazel baskets and then also for bows what they do is they uh, kind of set fires and prune around the trees and stuff or cut them and they for the basketry would use those that are about two to three years old and here we have the the oak trees that produce the acorns that were important to all of our tribes and here we have the uh, the white oak oak tree Anaway stick and the Anaway, which is the 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 acorns grows pretty common in the northern part of the state up along the Columbia River into the Willamette Valley and then we have numerous other oaks from the southern Oregon area such as the tannin oak and the black oak as well as the white oak and the acorn was an important and uh, these ones here are pretty young uh, but in the fall time they'll be ready and uh, wait till they drop to the ground then collect them up they're very bitter if you try to eat them just out of the shell and so some of our tribes would actually bury them in mud and store them in that way under by springs and that would take out the bitterness which is tannin that's contained in the acorns and then it was uh, pounded up and made into kind of like a flower and some of our tribes mixed it with other things and some of them made a uh, acorn mush out of it Here we have the service berry. This is one of our earliest berries and it was really important to all of our tribes from the Chinookan people along the Columbia River to the Kalapuyas, Brook River, Umqua, Shastas. And this was a primary berry and it was gathered and then dried and then uh, stored for the winter time. And then usually a lot of times mixed with other berries and foods. You know, the Life Waste Program, my take on it is that it's an attempt to recreate a little segment of uh, tribal life, which is um, when people would sit around together and eat and do their various crafts and tell stories and um, a kind, kind of uh, community building, friendship building uh, way of life that used to be commonplace for tribal life. And with, with most of the uh, folks around here being spread all over the, the map, um, it's an opportunity for tribal folks to get together and, and to uh, you know, enjoy a little bit of that tribal life setting and at the same time learn, learn new skills and be exposed to language and, and things such as that. I'm starting to make these headbands for um, some of our young girls who are going to be going through a uh, coming of age ceremony. So traditionally these headbands were made um, with blue jay feathers to cover their eyes so they couldn't see the sky. And we're bringing some of our, our cedar work into it because we have all of our different tribes represented in this ceremony and the feathers will go on top of those. Part of what we're restoring, you know, in these last 30 years, I think is very important to, to our tribe, especially our language, you know, the arts, you know, the, the basket weaving and, and um, the carvings and the, the art forms and stuff of the Lower Columbia River. I'm learning so much. And so for me, it's seeing the full cycle of things as opposed to you know, like going to the store and buying a basket or going to the store and buying something. But it's seeing where it comes from and how it grows and where to find them and just the community being together and being able to pass that on to my granddaughter. You know, finding out about Lifeways was like a big deal for me. Like to learn that there is a group, that there are people in the tribe that are that are doing this cultural revitalization and, and and cultural restoration and healing some of those gaps you know and repairing some of the damages like caused by termination is really important for me we've been coming to greg's classes for a long time since the kids were really little maddie was probably three or four years old when we first started going in portland 
I remember them going out and crushing the um, materials to make the paint and painting on drums. We did some carving. Um, that's when the kids were first introduced to Chinook Wawa there in the Portland office. You know, going out to the Camas Prairie and digging up bulbs, it creates like a, a community bond, you know, like with these other tribal members that I didn't necessarily know growing up and other families. And, and, and then knowing that like through this kind of stuff that like my kids will be able to grow up never having not known that stuff and having it just be a part of their life and not something that they have to like work hard at to pick up is a powerful thought, you know, and it, it says a lot to the kind of healing that's going on as a result of these LifeWays classes. So as you've seen, there's a wide range of activities we do for the LifeWays classes, and we encourage our tribal members and community to come join us, and we hope to see you soon.